for this lab, I think the biggest challenge is the only uh, simulation I could think of using to enable this uh, lab was the algodo simulation. And I am aware that uh, those of you using macOS with the version more recent than 2019 years version, then you can't run this simulation. So I won't be requiring any activities that uh, requires you to run this, be able to run this simulation. So uh, I will make this file available. I saved it. Uh, I will make it available uh, for those of you who want to try it out. But um, so what I want to do in this recording is I want to demonstrate um, what the lab would have been like if you were able to do it in person. And and um, do some of the uh, calculation activity that would have, you would have done as a part of the lab. So, um, so yeah, um, so he, this is the simulated version of the lab. Um, the lab comes in two distinct parts. There's a launcher that you would have been working with. And there's a, there's a, a pendulum that you would have been working with for a good portion of the lab. So uh, you would have seen this uh, pendulum with a cart, uh, obviously an actual 3D <laughs> cart, not a 2D representation. Uh, that would have been set up at your tables and um, it's a uh, you know, cart. Just it's uh, uh, fixed to a uh, hanging thing so that it's uh, stable relatively. It doesn't rotate too much. And uh, there would have been a kind of, oops, let's move it this way. There, I need to stop the simulation. Uh, there, oh, right. Uh, there would have been a, a launcher setup that's a setup to launch a ball into the cart. So, um, so yeah, so let me actually just uh, do a test run of what the experimental run would have been like. So um, let, let's see, I need to move this into place here. And let me let the simulation run for a little bit. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I can grab that and... Uh, so the launcher has a few different settings. Uh, the real life launcher actually has three settings, short, medium, long range. I just had uh, two different settings here. So short and long. So um, you launch the ball into the cart, into the catcher. Then it does this. The short range, I've never found that to be, even with the real lab, I never found that to be all that satisfactory so let me demonstrate that with a longer range where the spring is compressed more so the launch will be launching with a greater initial speed and what you the activity you would have done in lab is that you can analyze this setup you can make some measurements of the uh, motion that's uh, occurring with the catcher and the ball and and using those measurements you can calculate backward to figure out what was the speed of the ball at the time of the launch so let me um, <clears throat> let me slow down the simulation so that you can um, I can kind of talk to you about what the measurement you would have made is. Uh, wait, let's see, what do I do? I think the thing to do is, uh, all right, the simulation is right now much too slow. So let me just let it run for a bit so that, uh, come on, man. Uh, all right, let that come to a stop. I'm going to move the ball over here. It, it, it's because I uh, made the friction really large between the ball and the cart. So, um, <laughs> so that's why the cart keeps, uh, the catcher keeps getting dragged. All right, I think I'm ready. 
let the simulation run. All right, so I'm going to compress the spring to the uh, longest or the compress the spring as much as I can which you it was doing <laughs> uh, uh. <sighs> oh I, I think I can do something else uh, I, I believe uh, uh, I think when the simulation is running slower it's running more buggily but I think I can actually do something that it actually resembles your real lab more in that uh, instead of trying to do a stop motion thing with the catcher, I'm actually going to plot its position. More specifically, I can plot its Y position. So, um, it, well, I can plot its X and Y position. Um, you know, I probably should have plot both. I think that will give me some kind of control check that I can use. Um, so there it is. Um, so let me let the simulation run. Um, and when that catcher comes to stop eventually, then I will launch this ball and we'll take it from there. Mm, I hope the background noise in my room isn't too distracting. So, all right, I think that's good enough. Uh, let me reset. Uh, do I want to reset? Yeah, I think I want to reset. Um, and then, ready, set, go. All right. So that's all I need. Um, Yeah, and let me take the measurement. Uh, you know what, that noise is bothering me, so let me do this. I'm going to pause the recording briefly. I'm gonna turn off the thing that's making the noise and be right back. All right, I'm back. So, all right, so this plot uh, gives me everything I need. So it has a plot of the X position. I actually don't care about the X position. So what I care about is the Y position. You see that in the swinging motion of this uh, catcher, the Y position reached the maximum and then came down. So this is the, this would have been the key measurement you needed to make in the lab. Uh, that is what was the change in the Y position. So this, uh, let's use this as the reference position, y equals 2.217 meter, oh, seems high. <laughs> and the maximum height it reached is uh, 2.424. So it's a difference of, let's 2.424. So it's a difference of a 0 0.207, 0 0.207. Okay, um, let me, write that number down in a calculator. Um, mostly as a way to remember stuff, 0.27. Okay, uh, meters. Uh, by the way, this is way off scale uh, for your life. For your life, you know, actually 20 centimeters, I guess that's not too unreasonable. So maybe it'll <laughs> actually work out. Um, so let me uh, switch to my, let me, let's take a screenshot of this and let me switch to uh, uh, my, uh, my note taking software to uh, just to work out the calculation. So that's gonna take the next 15, 20 minutes and you would have done this part as part of your pre-lab so that when you come into the lab, you have the formula ready to use. So let me take a screen snip here. Um, I think I actually want to take a screen snip in multiple places. Uh, let me do it this way. So, um, I believe I want screen snip. Let me do slower simulation speed. Oh, 
Okay, that is one screenshot I need. And then let me take the next screenshot that I need. Uh, which is here, somewhere around here, where the ball is has is colliding with the catcher. And I guess catcher hasn't started moving yet. So, um, okay, there. Now ball and the catcher are moving um, together. This is the literal snapshot. <laughs> when I lecture, I actually talk about snapshots, but uh, you know, I, I like the literal things. So there's the literal snapshot. And then let me move this kind of out of the way so that my next uh, screenshot can be clean. Um, Let's see, I think I can use the plot to kind of guide me and stop it right at the, when it's at the height. Uh, oh, the, sorry, the timing's all, all messed up. I think I can still use the plot because there's a kind of leveling of place. All right, uh, I think that is probably the highest place. Yeah, so let me take a screenshot here. All right, these snapshots are what we use for analysis. So let me draw some um, kind of diagrams and uh, note the quantities of interest in these uh, screenshots. So in this uh, portion of the physical situation, what we are looking at and what we are interested in is how fast is this ball moving? How fast is our ballistic projectile moving? So let me call this a V naught. That's the, well, the, the red on blue is so ugly. Um, <laughs> let me try green. Is green better? No, I think maybe yellow will be better. Um, Yeah, so this V naught is a key unknown that we are trying to solve for, that we'll, we'll be trying to solve for. And the, this lab is designed to give you uh, two different, two independent ways to calculate this V naught so that you can compare them. Now, in analyzing this setup, um, you are limited by what you can measure and what you, what's more difficult to measure. So this way not measuring it directly is challenging. So that's what we are trying to do, calculate it from things that we can measure. Now, when these two things collide and move together, they will be, um, they will be moving together. Uh, what color do I want to use? Black. So, Considering this whole thing as one single system, not two separate bodies, because they are now stuck together, we look at them as a one single object that's moving with some speed. Let me call it for a final. And you know, final is in quotations because we are continuing to look at the situation. And this V final is a, it's a slower than the initial speed. But even so, it's just still a little bit on the fast, well, measuring speed directly is never an easy thing. When you have a video of some motion and you can do video analysis, you can measure it that way, you have done it that way. But most of the times, measuring speed directly is challenging. Now, what can be measured more easily is a change in position without necessarily uh, paying great deal of attention on the rate of change of position. So uh, I stopped this at the highest uh, point of the pendulum motion. And in the lab, you would have been given some device, 
some tools to help you do that. Now here in this picture, what I'm basically pointing out is the delta y. And that is what we measured. Uh, let me bring up this calculator here. I measured it to be 0 0.207 meters. And using that, we can walk, walk backward the steps to calculate the final velocity here. And using that, we can calculate this uh, initial velocity here. So let me do that. Um, now, there are, are some numbers that we will need to know, and they are the, uh, the masses of the colliding objects. So I need the mass of the catcher. Um, let me look at the simulation to uh, measure it. So material, the mass of the catcher is one point, uh, let me make the number, well, 1.94 kilograms. A bit unrealistic, but <laughs> it's a simulation. 1.94 1. 1. kilograms. All right, and we need the mass of the uh, ballistic projectile. And I think in the real lab, uh, yeah, the mass, of, there's a stainless steel ball that's pretty heavy that you can use, but we'll go with this one, 0 0.39 kilograms. Uh, yeah, I think that's why it doesn't swing up so much because the ball isn't all that heavy. All right, so these two numbers, we'll use them as symbols. They are known quantities in the lab. You would have measured them using the triple beam balance. So I, let me actually just literally go backward. <laughs> so let me start from here. Um, I have the uh, going from snapshot three to back to snapshot two. And my goal is to solve for this unknown V final. So the question to be asked here is going from snapshot three to two or vice versa. I'm kind of treating this as a reversible thing. You can, um, um, because really what I'm kind of uh, looking forward to is I'm using conservation law. And when you're using conservation law to solve some problem, you are setting two quantities at two different points equal to each other. And that equality goes both ways. So even though in time, the process is occurring from snapshot two to, snapshot two to three, um, in terms of calculation, you can go from snapshot three to two. So that's what I'm doing. So the question you have to consider and answer is in this process between snapshots three and two, what quantities are conserved? So it's a question of conserved quantities. And um, I hope it, um, after a few minutes of thinking about it, uh, it makes sense to you if you hear this answer that between snapshots two and three, mechanical energy is conserved and momentum is not conserved. If this doesn't make immediate sense, then <laughs> what you should be thinking about are, in terms of mechanical energy, you are looking for, is there any work done by non-conservative forces? If the answer is no, then mechanical energy is conserved. And you can kind of think through, you saw it in the swinging up process that friction doesn't do any significant work, tension force, uh, it's perpendicular to the displacement, so it shouldn't be doing work. Gravity is the only force doing work, but it's conservative. We can account for that in the potential energy change, and we will do that. So, so mechanical energy is conserved. For momentum conservation, you are looking at 
impulse due to external forces. And if there is impulse, then momentum won't be conserved. And here the biggest, uh, most, uh, well, two significant external forces that will be changing the momentum of this cart uh, ball com combination are the tension forces and the gravitational force. Those will be changing the uh, momentum of this catcher as it swings up. So momentum is not conserved. So that's the very first question you have to consider and answer. And once you answered it, that mechanical energy is conserved, then the solution is, the math is pretty simple. You set up the conservation of energy equation. Uh, let me write it here. I don't have all that much space there. So uh, conservation of energy. equations or equation. Um, you have energy in the snapshot too, which will be that this entire combination has some kinetic energy. So it's gonna be one half mass of the combination, the mass of the ball plus the catcher times the V final squared, that's the kinetic energy. And in snapshot two, let's say we have zero potential energy. Then we can look at what is the potential energy at snapshot three. So, um, so that's equal to the energy, total energy in snapshot three. The kinetic energy is zero here because it's at the highest point. It's neither moving up nor down. The speed is briefly zero plus the uh, potential energy. Uh, more precisely, it's a potential energy change from snapshot two, um, and the change is indicated by this delta y there. So let me write that. It's going to be gravitational potential energy, so the mass of the combination plus the cart gravitational acceleration times the change in height. Now, one simplification you see here is the mass cancels out. So if you are somehow to make a mistake and wrote down wrong mass, as long as you wrote down two wrong masses, they'll just cancel out. So this is one of the equations that we'll be using. Let me label this equation two to solve for the initial velocity of the ball. So to work the, out that, um, to work out the initial velocity of the ballistic projectile, uh, we now have to analyze the step between the snapshot one and snapshot two. So here's the snapshot one. So we are going through the same analysis as what we did before, looking at the process between snapshot two and one. And once again, because I'm looking forward to using conservation um, principle, this uh, process, I'm treating it as being reversible, basically. Uh, whether you're going from two to one or one to two, it um, doesn't matter for the purpose of conserved quantities. So same question about what quantities are conserved. And the, um, and the, it's the same consideration for energy conservation. You look for, is there any work done by um, non-conservative forces? And for conservation of momentum, you look at, is there any impulse due to external forces? Now, I think here's where it gets a little bit tricky because the, when you watch this scenario unfold, you don't, necessarily immediately see the friction force at work. So it's uh, easy to miss the fact that this does not conserve energy. I think what's uh, good for you to learn to recognize is that when you see collision like this, where two things stick together, that's what, it, what we call completely inelastic collision. 
So, um, and the key part here is in, oh wow, the key part here is in elastic. So it doesn't conserve, uh, technically it doesn't conserve kinetic energy, but it doesn't conserve mechanical energy. So the only conserved quantity in this scenario will be the total momentum. So we are going to write down the conservation of momentum equation. And uh, hopefully that will give us enough information to solve for the initial velocity here. So let me set up the conservation of momentum equation. So conservation of uh, total momentum equation. So um, in snapshot one, I have momentum of the ballistic, pen, um, ballistic projectile. Um, so mass of that projectile times its speed or velocity, free knot. That's equal to momentum in snapshot two which will be the uh, mass of the entire thing. Times the velocity of the entire thing. So looking at this expression, recognize that as something you can solve for the initial speed of V naught. V naught is equal to the ratio of the masses. times the, the final speed. Oh, I uh, have an equation for that there. So I guess it's a system of equations. Equ two equations, two unknowns, V naught and V final. We can solve for V naught, eliminating V final. So let me quickly do that. I can solve this for V final. I'm just gonna do that in my head. If you need to slow this, pause this video and work it out for yourself. So I'm doing this in my head. If we quote unquote final is equal to square root of 2g times delta y. And I check the units to make sure the units work out. Meter per second squared times meter uh, square root it should give me meter per second. So plug that in here and we get square root of 2g delta y. So this is the formula for the initial speed that you would have done as part of pre-lab. And in the lab, what you are basically able to do is use the setup to make these measurements and do this calculation. Oh, let me do the calculation since I have all the numbers. So um, this 0.27 meters was the delta y. So let me just multiply um, let me just multiply uh, 9.8 for G and multiply two for two. So that's the quantity under the square root, uh, square root. And I multiply that to the sum of the two masses, 1.94 plus 0 0.39 kilograms. They're all basic SI units, so I'm fine. Divided by uh, the mass of the ball alone. 0.39 equals, I get 12, 12.0, um, and that should be 12.0 meters per second. So this is equal to 12.0 meters per second. And if you go through the, um, Uh, if you do the simulation yourself using the file that I'll make available, and you can actually, you know, as long as it's a simulation, you can actually literally measure the uh, property of things. Uh, specifically, you can um, you can show plot, and you can just uh, plot the x and y velocity of the ball, and you can see that it has the speed when you launch it. So, um, and hopefully what you will find is that when you measure the velocity that way, it comes pretty close to this quantity that we calculated. Actually, let me do that and see. So I think I can, uh, let's see, undo to this point here. And uh, instead of plotting, 
uh, let me actually I, let me leave that one alone and I'm going to display one more plot that will not plot the um, well let's just plot x and y component of velocity and not speed um, okay uh, let's let the simulation run and I'll pause it uh, before the collision occurs there so the maximum y velocity it had was yeah uh, 12.6 so it's not exactly what we calculated we calculate 12.0 so there is some error so now the, that source of error is something that you would be investigating in the real lab now in the real lab we provide you with a second independent way to measure the velocity of the Goal. And let me just demonstrate that quickly here. And since this is kind of going back to your um, earlier part of the semester, I'll be uh, quicker with this calculation. So um, I'm actually going to undo to this point. And I don't care about the pendulum anymore. So let me, um, oops, not that. Uh, let me just uh, select this and move them way over here so that I can forget about the pendulum. And um, so th this is what you will do in lab. Um, so in lab, you would um, set this up, set up this uh, uh, project launcher on some uh, edge of the table so that you can launch into the room with about two, three meters of free space in front and what you would do is you, you are going to launch it. You'll compress it down uh, to the same setting that you're using before. And then when you let go, it'll launch like that. And I have some things in the um, in-person lab to help you measure that landing point. You can measure the range. And using that range and the height, you can go back to your projectile motion and calculate what that speed must have been. So uh, let me quickly do that. I think I can actually do that pretty quickly here. So um, I need to plot the, uh, let me plot only the things that you will be able to measure. So I'm going to be showing the positions of the ball. And I think I can use that to both measure the height, technically, and the, um, and the range. So uh, where do I want to put this? Gonna put it here, yeah. All right, uh, do I want, I don't think I need to slow down simulation here. So let me just fire it and I'll stop it once the ball lands. All right, good enough. So I see um, two different things here. So one is the Y position here. So it goes from the height of 3.305 meters. Now that's not necessarily the actual height. I want to get the difference in height because once it's landed there, then that's technically what should have been my Y equals zero. So that's uh, uh, 0.246. So uh, 0.329, <laughs> let me do this on a calculator, I can't keep those numbers in my head. <laughs> so it's going from 0.3 to 3.294 minus subtract the uh, number here, 0.248. So 3.046 meters. Now this is obviously much higher than what the actual number would be um, in your case, where's the, ah, there's the annotation tool. Um, so let me just write the number down. So that's gonna be my uh, height. So height at launch is 3046 meters about the uh, I, I think it's gonna be fine um and i need a range um so for the range this is what i'm going to do that's why i plotted both the 
x position and the y position. So when the y position comes to zero here, uh, at the same time, so that's uh, the um, that's the landing position. So fifteen point oh wait, this, yeah yeah fifteen point oh two five. That's the position x. Um, fifteen point oh two five minus now my zero isn't zero, so I have to be careful here. What I should be treating as my zero is around. Let's say 4.1 meters, 4.2, 4 point, 4 .2 meters, 4.2 meters. So 10.8 to 5 meters. Let me round these numbers. H, that's going to be just uh, uh, 3. <laughs> 3 meters. And the uh, Y position there is going to be 10.8. Uh, sorry, not Y position. Um, the range there is going to be just 10.8. So let me draw a kind of diagram for range. Oh, I forgot. I could have done the tracer. Let me do the tracer um, so that it, it's uh, more easily visualized requires less of um, uh, imagination, uh, 10.8 meters. So let me uh, go back, undo through some steps. And what I can do here is I can um, put a tracer. There's a material velocity. Oh, I think I'm. Uh, attached tracer. All right. Uh, let's see how that goes. Yeah. Oh, so I didn't quite draw. Yeah, but you can imagine what that. <laughs> So the, the pro correct range uh, marker should go out to here. That's what I'm uh, writing down here. So, um, so that's all the numbers you need and that's the numbers you do measure in lab. And you go through this uh, calculation that you r hopefully remember from I think chapter four. Um, so you have your kinematics equations. The X position is given by, as a function of time, is given by um, the initial velocity. That's the horizontal component of initial velocity. Yeah. Initially, it's launched horizontally, times the time. And at the final time, uh, the number you get at that final, quote unquote, final time will be your range value. And you can do the same thing for the y component of motion. So the y position of the ball as a function of time. Now this will be slightly more complicated because there's a gravitational acceleration. So it'll be minus one half g t squared um, plus the initial velocity is zero. So that makes our equation a little bit simpler because that's just going to be zero. And the initial height, let's say that uh, height, oops, uh, not equals. Let's say that initial height is h. Now, if we are looking at, once again, quote unquote, the final time, that's when the ball lands, then at that final time, the height should be equal to zero. So once you have written this down, then what you have is a system of a system of equations, one and two. You can solve this for V naught, eliminating T final because you don't care about T final. So, uh, so let me do that. Uh, you can eliminate T final 
I think uh, overall it's going to be easier if I do it from the second equation. So from equation two, um, I move this one half gt squared over and um, then I solve for t squared and then I take the square root. When I do that, I get t final is equal to two times h divided by g square rooted. And make sure the units work out. You see the meters canceling out and one over second squared in the denominator resulting in what's second for t final. So this becomes something I can plug into one. So plugging that into one and solving for v naught, you get v naught is equal to r over t final or writing it aloud, r times square root of g over 2h. So that's the um, expression that you would work out as a kind of a review of projectile motion. So now that I have that, let me just plug in numbers and see if I'm close. Um, so let's clear everything here. So let's see, uh, let me do the thing inside the square root first. 9.8 divided by two divided by the height, three meters. So that's the thing inside the square root. Let me take the square root times the range, 10.8. I get 13.8 meters. So yeah, which is different from <laughs> what I had before. But using this uh, separate independent method, I get this number that um, the initial speed I get this number that the initial speed of the ball, V0, was equal to 13.8 meters per second. And what you do have spent some time in the lab kind of thinking through, discussing is, okay, so I have these two numbers which should have been the same, are not exactly the same, so what are some potential sources of error? So here, the error that I'm looking to explain is the difference between 13.8 and, and, uh, and 12.0. So that's a difference of 1.8. So it's uh, um, about 15% error. So I need to find about 15% error somewhere. And, um, I don't know where to find it. Well, anyway, so that's a kind of a question that's a more useful for you to consider than for me to answer in this simulation scenario. So I'll leave that for you. But that's the gist of what you to be doing in this lab. I'm super bummed that we can't um, that um, we can't do this in person. But I hope watching through this video, you at least get some sense of what you're missing out on.